Yeah. So welcome to the uh, 26 Fogra Fellow Management Cafe. My name is Yuan Li, co-hosting this with my colleague um, Andy Prosser. And as guest speaker, we have David Hunter from the uh, company Chroma Checker. And uh, today's topic is appearance match in real work applications. And um, this cafe will be recorded and um, uh, will be available online later in our Fogra Media Tech. <laughs> And uh, if you have any questions, please press the raise hands button and we can unmute you um, accordingly. Well, we'll begin with an uh, with a introduction by Andy and followed by the presentation by uh, David. And um, oh. Yeah, thank you very much, Joanne. Welcome anyone on board here. Uh, Happy New Year. It's our first cafe in the uh, Post-corona, hopefully a year. Let's see. Uh, yeah, today we will go beyond our color. And with me, I'm very happy to have uh, a gentleman known by the name of Dave Hunter. And most of you uh, know him, of course. He was also a color management speaker at the 2018 color management symposium, as you can uh, see here. Yeah, you will hear much more from him, and he will introduce uh, himself and. Uh, will be the the lead reverend and uh, speaker today. So uh, let us give you an introduction from a Fokra point of view as we typically open this kind of monthly cafe. And as always, please uh, raise your hand to tell us if you have a question that we can have this dialogue, this cafe as it's supposed to be, um, that we can you can ask the questions also. Um, Writtenly, then we uh, read it here as you wish. So this is something um, you determine how active you would like to contribute. Please use that, that chance. Yeah, um, what we think when dealing with color uh, is something I uh, yeah I call today color appearance color. And what I mean is that we know more or less inherently that um, the appearance of objects is much more than simply the, the, the color. Uh, in most typical use cases when we talk about prints, we know that uh, the color and color accuracy typically is, is enough. When we have the color accuracy in place, uh, mostly or most other aspects are more or less okay-ish. But of course, if that is not the case, we, we realize it. Uh, and uh, you see when we try to understand the complete appearance, we need uh, four different uh, areas, not only the, the color by its diffuse uh, reflectance. We also need to, to understand the cloth of, of objects. And this is not covered by, by colorimetry at all. So you can have a very glossy proof media, for instance, and make a perfect Graykel or um, Fokra data match with one zero delta E uh, to IFRA 26, you know, our uh, newspaper standard. And uh, the colorimetry would be perfect, but the visual mismatch would be strong because, you know, the glossy is proofing substrate. And even if you if you put it outside the, the glossy angle, the specular angle. And the third one is translucency, the, you know, the milkiness. Uh, and that is something for some subjects, which we, again, in printing industry often don't have. But if you measure teeth or, or plastics for the tree the print area, for instance, you come across um, surface properties where we have scattering in the media, and that requires you to use specific color measurement uh, principles, uh, like overfilling and this kind of stuff. And texture, this is also something that just if you measure like this and like this, you will get completely different uh, values, color values. And that is something you need to take into consideration um, if you have samples that happen to have this kind of property. And you can see this already in a 2011 uh, kind of Fokra News uh, article here, where we try to explain this, uh, this helicopter perspective that uh, uh, we would like to, uh, to, yeah, to do research on from Fokra point of view. And uh, the, coming back to the title here, we see that if you go beyond color and you have your surface properties and your difference, um, 
uh, you will see that there are many concepts like distinctive of images and a lot of uh, differential cloths, uh, metalliness, waviness, and a lot of appearance attributes people in specific industry talk about. But uh, at the end, if the, from the customer point of view, what you do is uh, you don't complain a car when you get a repaint. Oh, the distinctive of images is not correct. No, people again call it the color is wrong. And so people, although as we know that color by its colorimetry definition and by its appearance complex interaction, again, typically will be aggregated and communicated as, uh, as color. And so and that's why with color management, I also consider myself, or focal point of view, also doing appearance management, because people at the end consider this and aggregate this to some extent as a color problem. Yeah? And uh, that's why we have it here on our radar. And there's a lot of stuff we are doing from POCRA point of view. We have uh, research projects uh, finished and ongoing. You can find them on our new web page where we developed L score and P score and M score to measure uh, certain uh, properties besides color. And we provide the test from studio of charge. There's something like an image quality re report you can find on our web page freely to see uh, what is there uh, already up and running. We have partners uh, worldwide leveraging this kind of services, so you can also consider this. There's a lot of information in our uh, on our website um, uh, where to find a partner or how to become a partner. We also are hosting here uh, uh, an EU project, or we are part of an EU project where you can see how many other organizations and institutes are part of. And we host here um, an early stage researcher, Donatella David, with us, and she's uh, focusing in that project um, the consideration the clause. This is uh, again to, to improve your uh, German speaking capabilities. So, Dave, please double check. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, that's why those are the work packages typically, and uh, this is to consider and to understand better the the measurement techniques and the communication of CLOS using ICC Max uh, colors, uh, yeah, color management, so the next generation color management. And uh, one thing before I give the mic to, to Dave is uh, that we have our digital printing working group, you know, where we uh, have a physical meeting every year. And then uh, at, the, at the last meeting, we also discussed what are typical ongoing projects. Um, uh, what are typical upcoming potential new projects? And uh, as you know, uh, projects are not being um, registered or planned uh, because we love it. No, because we think there is a need in the industry. So you tell us uh, what FOCRA should uh, spend taxpayer money for. That is the uh, truth. Yeah? So that's why we uh, discuss with you what are the problems. And one is actually to, to develop um metric where all the different image quality aspects are aggregated together to have this uniform scale this uniform index this percentage value and if you are very closely look you can see chroma checker there dave uh, and you can see many other tools there color toolbox x right uh press sign espresso color chart color beat and there are many programs on the market they use more or less uh, available uh, image quality metrics, color accuracy, TBI, near neutral curves, uh, misregistrations, and they aggregate it more or less to this single score. But as you know, then an 80% uh, Heidelberg score does not match an 80% um, x ray score. And so the idea here in this idea is to develop. Uh, a, a metric which we then share as an ISO standard where anyone can add this as an addition. So we don't expect that everyone is deleting their proprietary legacy, of course not, but we would like to work with them together to develop something uh, to implement in addition that you can say, oh, an 80% Dave score uh, is a 65% uh, just a Bruno score or something like this, that you have this again uh, across vendor um, referee approach yeah and this is uh, one idea where we also include uh, not only color accuracy metrics but also misregistration 
and uh, surface properties which we will know uh, which we will learn today yeah so this is something where we ask you invite you to uh, be a part of that kind of project committee and project advisory committee both for new project but also for ongoing projects there is um, uh, one for understanding the 3D printing uh, colorimetry and uh, in this case for instance it's important to have the translucency under control because uh, some of the 3D printers have very translucent material so if you just take an i1 pro of course you will get an LAB value but that's the problem you need to double check whether those LAB values are visually plausible you need a huge uh, ratio from overfilling to uh, pickup and that is something specific here where we work on in this case with Fabieri to, to de develop normal uh, devices that can be used to measure in a plausible way uh, those kinds of surfaces. So this is also an invitation to join our ongoing projects. And last uh, a final reminder on our web academy uh, which is uh, has been started with all, over 400 attendees and we can also do a test there or you can do a test there to become a, a graduate and interestingly 70 percent uh, of the uh, of the web academy uh, attendees uh, did participate and most of them i think 80 percent uh, passed uh, the test so this is kind of okay we can live with that ratio so this is something uh, just for you if you don't know our web academy uh, offering just have a look yeah and with that being said uh, let's have a look whether there is uh, as a question and if not we will have a look uh, if not we will give the mic and the screen to dave let's see if you have a raised hand or something like this here there's a question but i can check the question right now um it was great okay 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 it was already covered perfect It seems that we that all clear everything is clear so far. So, Dave, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, great. Thank you, Andy, and 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 thank you for inviting me to uh, share with the group the capabilities of our uh, new technology called Chroma Checker Nano. Before before I go into Chroma Checker Nano, I'd like to uh, talk. A little bit about chroma checker chroma checker is exactly what andy was uh explaining is our our system is a uh, a color conformance platform that assesses every variable that affects color reproduction we've been uh successful in the market for a number of years now with some very large international companies and our system assesses any type of print process so for instance Andy mentioned HP Color Beat. Our system can dynamically take the HP Color Beat data in from Color Beat into our cloud, showing everyone, including the operator, how well that press is performing. We also can take data from a Heidelberg or an X Rite IntelliTrax or a large format Canon Arizona printer uh, to aggregate all of your printers in one. Uh, system centralized cloud to show you how they're performing. In addition to that, we act as a central repository for all things color, CXF palettes, ICC profiles, near neutral curves. So it's, it's a one-stop shop for color. And what we've added to the mix is our, our nano solution, which we call more than color because it's getting into the, the appearance aspects that, that Andy was talking about. So I'm really, I feel privileged to be here to share with you uh, about our nanotechnology. And, and also I wanna learn more from the research that's going on with your groups on how we can improve it even more and add some additional things. So as Andy said, Fogger's been investigating appearance metrics uh, extensively, which is fantastic, and hence all the more reason I'm happy to be here. Uh, we're a software company. Uh, we build software for hardware. The hardware that we're going to be talking about is from a company called Colorix. 
And um, I'll be uh, demonstrating this, uh, this unit in, in a little bit so you can see how it works. And we've been able to not only assess color using this instrument, and uh, we, we call it average color when you uh, average the data within the aperture, but we also implemented a, a dominant color algorithm, which you'll hear more about. But in regard to surface characteristics, we currently have three surface characteristic metrics that we've developed. One is called surface match, one is called uniformity, and one is called vibrance. Now, that's what we've been able to do with this instrument. But since we're a software company, our software has been built to support virtually any type of measurement system, including glossiness, spherical instruments, roughness, multi-angle and multi-function. So today we're, we're talking about one solution with one piece of hardware, but our software can be adapted to work with virtually any type of hardware to help us collect this information, which will quantify whether or not the object that we're working with has both a color and an appearance match to the customer's expectations. One, one now, question, Dave. Of course. Uh, what is the status with the Canon Reflectance Analyzer? Is it already uh, negotiated? So I connected you with Canon because they built a great device. Is there any interest to integrate it or was it kind of um, no much overlap? No, no, uh, we're very interested. In, yeah, thank you for that connection. And yeah, we're in discussion. So it, it, it makes total sense. Okay, perfect, perfect. Okay. Yes, th thank you for that. Okay. And um, oftentimes, as, as Andy was mentioning, objects might have three attributes or six attributes that affect the appearance. So what we've already done in our color cloud software, Chroma Checker, is in our color inspector, you can have multiple parallel tracks that assess different attributes related to an object. So for instance, we might have an object like, um, uh, well, Google is one of our accounts and Google makes a thermostat called the Nest thermostat. We can not only track the color of that Nest thermostat, but we can track the uh, surface characteristics of that and potentially the, the glossiness of that, of that finish on the material. So there's no one instrument that I know of today that, that measures both surface characteristics and gloss and color at the same time. So with our software, you can have multiple tracks with different instruments feeding each track to give you all the data you want about that physical uh, production product, whether it's a physical product like a, a thermostat or an a actual print product. So. The reason I'm bringing this up is because we're we're very open to working with third parties to build additional models to help address this issue in the industry. And like like Andy said, he he uh, he, he passed a, a contact on to us that is doing things on the hardware side. We're doing things on the software side. So th this is such a new market. Uh, in terms of putting all these pieces together, that it's a very exciting time. And um, I'm just here to say we don't know all the answers, but we, we want to build solutions with uh, third-party products that help address company needs. So any feedback would be fantastic. And if you've ever seen me present, I love questions. So please feel free to stop me at any time and ask questions. Okay, and Andy, you'll be monitoring my, uh, you'll be monitoring yes, the feed yes. and cut in when there's questions. Thank perfect, you. Perfect, perfect, yes. Awesome. We do. Awesome, so the, the product that we're literally announcing this week is uh, a, a combination of a, a piece of hardware from a company called Colorex, a European company, and then Chroma Checker, and uh, uh, we're actually, uh, our whole development team is in, in Europe. So uh, I happen to be in the US, but, but our development team, my partners are in Europe. And we've developed this uh, solution called the Chroma Checker Nano, 
which consists of a hardware piece, uh, iOS piece, and our color cloud called Chroma Checker. And these three pieces work together to provide the solution. Now, um, this is a video. Oops, this is a video that I want to take you through, and it talks about one of the applications of of our uh, of our solution. So I'm just gonna let the video play and. Andy, do you hear the sound? Um, no, it is a little bit muted. Or... Oh, you don't. You don't hear. Do the you sound? hear it? Uh, I, no, I we just it. see the picture. You have sound okay. to it, so maybe just just explain something. That's easier. Okay, so here, let me do this. Let me do this. Let me just, uh, if you don't mind, start over, and I'll I'll just tell you what's going on. Here. Uh, very ambient. No, not really. Okay, okay. Let me let me let me do it, and I'll just do the commentary. Okay. Perfect. Okay, so this is a paper book with thirteen different embossed samples, and what we're going to do is we're going to show how the the uh, nano can differentiate the different embossing, uh, and it's the exact same paper, so. There's no color difference. So here's the paper book, uh, 13 different embossing samples. And what we're going to do is show you how the nano works to measure the reference and then measure the samples. So right now, um, we're going to choose the cedar as the reference. And we're going into the iOS app and creating what's called a new track. And we're going to make this new track called cedar. And here we're pinching out on the aperture. This instrument has an aperture of 0.3 millimeter yes 0.3 up to 6.2 so right now it's measuring a 6.2 aperture and then pushing the button it captures the picture and the color and the surface characteristics of this reference and now we're changing the tolerances a little bit we're tweaking the tolerances to take the surface match from an 80 percent which is a default to a 90 percent uh, value then we're saying create so it's just built the reference. Now we're going to quickly assess the sample against the reference. So by moving the instrument and rotating the instrument, we're clicking on the button and you can see it's passing both color and texture. And you can see the right side is the picture. And when you first push the button, it shows you a, a live window. And as you move it around, you can adjust it. And then when you click the button the second time, it actually captures the value and uploads it to the cloud. So now we're changing to a different texture and we're measuring it. And in this case, uh, the first button is the view. The second button is the assessment and it's failing. And you'll see it here. First button, it's a live window on the right. And now the second button, it's a fail. Each of these are dynamically being uploaded to the cloud so that um, we have a history of everything going on here. And you can see the upper left hand corner of the iPhone screen. It's showing you the color match and it's like all like 0.3 delta E. But um, the textures in the paper is why it's failing. Now we're trying to fool it. We went back to the cedar and we're saying, hey, measure the cedar and it, it passes. So now we're going to another texture and it'll of course fail. So in this way, we're showing how uh, texture greatly affects the appearance of how we see color. And with the nano, we can uh, assess any of these textures and then 
up here is the cloud view and you see the books at the top and the cedars the second one down and there's 12 different measurements and here's the timeline of the 12 measurements we just took and the first four over on the left were the first measurements and measurement number nine was the, the one where we tried to fool it and if we click on the magnifying glass it gives us a line listing of all the parameters where we've asked to track it tracks many more parameters we just haven't asked for all the parameters and if you click on the magnifying glass again, it goes in and shows you the picture of the reference and the measure. And you see we're tracking delta L, delta A, delta C, delta H, delta large H. Uh, and here's the average and the dominant. And, and you can set which metrics are normative versus which ones are informative. Uh, there's a close up of the picture showing you the texture. So in this way, it's, it's a, a very complete. Uh, uh, aggregate of the data that was just measured and you see just one green check on the top and one red X here those are the two normative metrics that we've applied to this sample we could have applied normative metrics to virtually any of those values that you see there so um, it, it's, it's very flexible in terms of uh, defining what is important to you in terms of the visual appearance of an object? And yeah, already um, question. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, you quite quick. I need to to spot the mini second where I can interrupt you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, it, it's harder if you want to interrupt me. I expect. Um, yeah. Uh, again, for the for the audience, again, if you want to. Uh, Raise your question orally, just raise your hand and then we unmute you. So it's all, all is perfectly fine. If you write your question, we will uh, read it here. Yeah, That is the, the rule. So one question is, does it also work for the same paper on different weights, different parameters? Uh, I'm sorry, what was the question? Does it uh, work with the same paper on different weights if you have just different oh, sure. parameters? Yeah. If, I expect if, this uh, is Okay. The other question is: uh, the the nano seems to be D65, and how about this with the, the D50 kind of um, uh, graphic arts standards? Do you go inside more on the hardware of this device to get us uh, an overview of the specs, or is it something you can answer right now? Um, it's something I'd rather forward to you. I mean, the specs of the uh, the instrument in terms of the aluminum that's in the instrument, it it is a um, um, it, it's not what I would call an M1 instrument, right? Um, it, it is a, uh, I, I would liken it, I don't, I don't know that the manufacturers officially deemed it as M0 or M2, but with our research, I would liken it more to an M2 type instrument in that it doesn't have any uh, um, UV in the light. This version doesn't have any UV in the, in the light source. So, so essentially, it's it's measuring like an M2 condition. Does that yes. help answer the question? Yeah, I, I think so. It's uh, we also had uh, at the symposium a presentation um, about this device, so we can uh, point to that presentation with with more background. It's a it's a uh, it's an imaging sensor, so. Um, I would not consider this in the same uh, league as, you know, our spectrophotometers. So that's why we should not claim uh, that this is giving colors as uh, the benchtop or other uh, high quality spectrophotometers. So that's why it's different. It is just scoping for different uh, approach. And, uh, Correct. Correct. I've done extensive research on it in terms of how well it correlates to like an exact or a Teshcon or a I1. And um, it, it, it depends upon your expectations, but it's not what I would deem very close. Um, we're talking probably an average of three delta E difference. So it's not way out in left field, but it's not uh, usable as a one-to-one -one comparison either. But from a within unit repeatability and a um, uh, cross unit repeatability, it's very stable. So from that standpoint, it's a, it's a nice platform to at least uh, measure the texture and appearance and yeah. have some color. And what we've done is, let's say, 
let's say your standard is based on uh, D50 and uh, a specific instrument, like a, let's say an ex exact. Um, you can measure the same object with this instrument and in our software track them parallel. So even though you might be the owner of the exact, if someone else has a nano, as long as you measure the master color with both instruments, then you can be assured that as long as that instrument reproduces that master color that is correct, then you can use the nano and the exact in the same uh, quality chain, if you will. Yeah, yeah like uh, you can use RGB-based uh, inline sensors for on-press control. Yeah, so this is exactly. if you have a reference. And uh, actually, I remember when I wrote. The summary of the symposium, I called it inspirational color. So this is measuring inspirational color this was, uh, because then because it's covering so much different surfaces. Okay, go, just go on. Okay, great. So now we're going to get into some of the details. I've got a, a number of slides that talk about the details and probably answer some questions in regard to what you might have seen in the video. Um, so the aperture is from 0.3 millimeter to 6.2 to round up a little bit. Uh, it has, and you saw pinching with the uh, iOS uh, app, how easy it is to uh, uh, choose what aperture you're going to want to use. And you only get to set the aperture when you're measuring the reference. Mm -hmm. After you've measured the reference, obviously the aperture is, is fixed and the operator can't uh, change it. And um, we bo do both an average color uh, assessment of the uh, values with inside the aperture, but we also have a dominant color algorithm, and I'll talk more about how that works in, in a few slides, but it's, it, it really captures the essence of the color, which is unique. And um, in this way, we've been able to measure all types of objects, whether it's uh, plastics, uh, aluminum, uh, wood, um, things that um, you, you just couldn't really do before. Easy. Uh, Dave says, uh, one question from Joe, Judy, about what um, texture metric was used. So if you measure the texture from uh, the, the paper samples, is there uh, a number from, let's say, 0 to 100, and then you compare two different uh, numbers? Do you do you go into this a little bit more detail? Or Yes, no? yes. This will be in a couple of slides. Okay, perfect. Yeah, we wait. Yeah, we'll wait just, just, a, just a minute or two. Um, so um, obviously there's techn technology benefits such as uh, accountability and expert level reports. Um, the selected areas of application, we've got people using this in uh, measuring skin color. I mean, you know, I think first time anyone got a, a spectrophotometer, they measured their skin and we're often, I was disappointed by the results that I saw. This, when I measure the skin, is unbelievable because it's an imaging type device. So you actually see the skin. You see, in my case, my freckles and uh, hair follicles and things like that. And it, it, it takes that into consideration and it can actually tell the difference between, let's say, my skin and someone else's skin or skin that's exposed to sunlight and skin that isn't. So, and you can quantify these things as you'll see. But um, there's cosmetics has been a, a very uh, interesting uh, uh, area for us. Um, fabrics, plastics, uh, big, big areas. So we'll, we'll talk more about some of this. The fact it is a cloud uh, solution. So everything being done through the iOS app is being stored up on the cloud and being tracked in terms of who did the measurement and when the measurement was done. So it's all traceable. Um, this is a screenshot of the color inspector, which gives you multiple hierarchies so that you can uh, organize your, your products and a, a product is, if you will, the, um, I won't call it the superset, but it's kind of the main uh, object level. Products can be grouped together. And then within a product, you can have multiple objects and within objects, you can have multiple tracks. So it's just how you uh, store and organize your data so you can um, reference it and uh, do other types of things with it. Here's a screenshot that, go ahead. There's also one question, Dave. Yep. 
um, about uh, to combine color evaluation and surface evaluation we need to have two measurements uh, don't we or two different measurements and maybe even now or later we can uh, explain how you deduce those figures from this uh, camera picture well I think this slide actually answers it so so here's here's an actual object it's a RAL fluorescent color and what we're showing is how it's 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 the same color but we have uh what nine tracks that represent this color per different instruments so you have a reference value of an object or a color and then you can have how your gloss meter interprets this object how your roughness meter interprets this how your spherical spectro interprets it how your multi-angle interprets it how your nano interprets it and so in this way you have uh, uh, multiple instruments defining the specific attributes that are important to you about that instrument related to this physical object and just for fun when you take a look at it, i don't know if you can see this very well but if you look at the leb differences between how a nano measures this color versus a, a barbieri um, it's pretty dramatic, uh, and, but that's okay. We know no two instruments measure color the same, and we know that better than anyone because we have, we have our instrument inspector uh, application within Chroma Checker, which tracks uh, not only how consistent your instrument is over time, but how different your instruments are from one another, and we can actually compensate for the difference between the instruments on the fly but that technology really only works when you're dealing with like an automated measurement device that's measuring lots of measurements uh, very quickly when we're dealing with a manual measurement device or a spot type measurement device like a nano you're not going to take the time to measure all the the common values to be able to uh, harmonize instrument data together so that's why we came up with this multi-track uh, configuration so that you can um, store different definitions per the instrument related to the same object. Did, did cool. that answer your question? We, I, I cannot say because I just read the questions from people uh, uh, writing it as to us. So we, they can restate that question or again raise uh, their hand and then we can discuss orally as they wish. We also got uh, the, the link to the Nano uh, website, so we will share the link now in the in the chat button. Anyone can have a look at it to get more uh, information the vendor is providing uh, here uh, and, about. And the, we'll the make this presentation available too. Perfect, perfect. And there's another question: uh, Does it work, or did you test uh, the, the Nano also on metallic papers or metallic surfaces? Uh, yeah, it, it does, and you'll see some samples here. The, the, uh, the type of area that can challenge it is a mirrored type surface because of, of course, the reflection of the lighting, but we have a sample of that too to show you uh, how that works. Perfect. Okay. Go on. So, so we, I, I referenced the fact that it has multi-level tolerances, so you can have individual tolerances for average color, dominant color, and the surface properties, which includes the surface match, color vibrance and uniformity, which I'm gonna talk about more in a few minutes. Uh, the apertures we've discussed can go from a, a very small aperture, 0.3 millimeter, uh, all the way to 6.18. And the champion, what we call the chroma checker champion, or the expert, is the one that goes in and sets the tolerances. And as you saw in the video, um, if I log in to my, nano application and i'm the expert i can set tolerances i can set references i set the aperture i i do all of that because i know what i'm doing most of the time <laughs> um but if if, if if somebody else uh if somebody else who let's say is brand new to this and they they were flipping burgers last week doing whatever and now you're asking them to measure color you're not going to have them do the 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 standard you're just going to have them do the quality control check so when they log in we'll, we'll say their name's peter when peter logs in uh 
he doesn't have the ability to make a standard or adjust anything. All he has the ability to do is measure the color and see whether or not it's a pass or fail. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, I referenced in my intro slide that we're collecting a lot of data from this instrument. And so far we've only um, formalized three, what I would call appearance metrics, the surface batch vibrance and the uniformity. We have additional data that could be applied to other appearance type models that we haven't, shall we say, completely parsed or sorted out. So uh, this is where, again, we'd love to have input from uh, people out there in terms of what else is important and what else uh, an imaging device like this could potentially uh, provide and see if the numbers that we're collecting on every measurement could help uh, formalize another metric for uh, appearance model. And for, for the for the texture um, uh, example, what uh, indices did you use in that case with the IU Wiggins book? What of the three is uh... so what we used in the in the book was what we call the surface match parameter. The surface match, okay. Yep. So so um, we will. I hold on. I will wait. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's okay. You're leading right into it. And no, Andy didn't see the presentation ahead of time. <laughs> um, so in the surface match parameter, um, it, it looks at the um, material that's being measured. And, and you can see the scores that are being shown up here. So like bottom left corner, the marble, the marble differences, they're, they're different, different um, um, what do I want to call it? It's, it they look different. So it's only a 69% match. Uh, where the wood, it's a it's a visually closer match, but it's 87%. If you remember in the video, which I don't expect you to, but you can always go back and view it again, uh, we changed the surface match to, to a 90%. Uh, and, and so um, you have the ability to choose what level of, of uh, match you want. And you can also choose the uh, aperture size. As you can see, the patent leather is a uh, smaller aperture, more like a three millimeter aperture, where the, uh, the wood in the upper left is more like a six millimeter aperture. So in this way, the surface match is doing some uh, very unique algorithm calculations to, to compare how similar the, um, the texture is and and in this way uh, you can quickly determine your tolerances for what's appropriate for you but that that's a slide later on so we'll, we'll save that for a, a slide here's some and, more um, materials and, yes and, and it's an algorithm in a way that you measure two absolute figures like a lightness one a lightness two and then a difference in lightness or is the the, 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 the algorithm uh, uh, using two pictures and providing the difference. Does it only provide, or not only, but does it provide the difference, the, the percentage and difference, or does it also okay. provide the, the individual input value to say, this is the value X and this is the value Y, and you can also give it some meaning in an absolute sense, or does it, is it only designed for uh, the, giving this, this difference math? Okay, great question. So it, it's, uh, if I'm understanding it correctly, uh, uh, the answer is it's, it's virtually all numeric. So, so it's, a, it's a combination of, of, of numeric numbers that we're capturing related to the object that we've put together in a very unique way to help us determine how close the match is. And, mm -hmm. and in this way, the angle that the uh, measurement is done doesn't affect the number. It's just, are there two different, uh, I understand that you have two images and you calculate the difference uh, index here and this is a lot, it's very meaningful. Um, the question was, do you have in, uh, in the process two individual numbers where you say this is, the, let's say for the textile uh, examples, do you have a textileiness uh, property which you measure and then you have a textileiness property on the right that you measure 
with from the two measurements and then you just do the subtraction uh, mathematically or is it uh, an algorithm which is based on two images directly leading to the difference without having an absolute value for textureness uh, beforehand well if i'm if i'm understanding it correctly i mean we're we're, we're calculating we'll, we'll call it uh, 15 numbers related to the uh the reference and then when we do the sample we're calculating those same 15 numbers and then we're comparing the two and just saying hey how close are these so it, 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 in other words in other words could you measure something and make a rank from the book with respect to um, textureness so if you have individual numbers uh, then you could measure all pages of the book and then you rank them with respect to what you consider textureness for instance or is it not intended to do such a ranking on an absolute individual measurements, but having always two measurements and giving you an indication how close the two measurements are? Um, that is a, a really good question. And um, uh, let me let me get back to you on that. I'm gonna my my partners, the engineers on this. Um, they I, are on board. I, I, they're on, they're on board. I, I'd rather not answer that question because I don't want to answer it incorrectly. So I'm going to say I, I'm not sure. Sorry, um, go on. That's a problem not having okay. you here. That's, okay. <laughs> that's what this is about. This is a, this is about uh, education and learning and and uh, so yeah. No, I don't apologize for the question. It's great. Uh, okay. Hopefully we'll have an answer uh, uh, soon. Okay. Uh, so. Obviously, you see the samples on the screen here in terms of the different um, uh, variables that we're looking at. You know, I guess I, I let me rephrase the, your question to make sure my partners understand this right. So, is the question that let's say when I'm reading the book and I read the reference of the book, that's we'll call it you know 100, and then when I read uh, uh, embossing one, that might be uh, 80 and embossing two is 70 and embossing three is 60. Can we can we affirm from that that the first emboss is the closest to the reference, the second is the second closest, and the third is the third closest because the first had the highest number and the second had the second highest number and the third had the third highest number? It, was that essentially what your question was? Uh, yes, basically, the, it's without this comparison, because what did what was uh, what is the problem if the next page gives 150? You know, when you have absolute values, you have this uh, range, and if you compare two yeah. things, uh, it is a different Perfect. setup of question. In so, case so of my engineers, my engineers have told me that it's relative; it's not absolute. Oh, perfect. Understood. Okay, great. <laughs> okay. Um, now the the second surface parameter or the, the second uh, appearance parameter that we're looking at is called uniformity and the uniformity is how consistent is the uh, uh, the um, shall we say the appearance within the aperture range so when it's a, a, a extremely flat type appearance as you see over on the left it's a very small number and when it's a very shall we say complex uh, area within the aperture area, it's a high number. So it, it has to do with the pixel variations that give us the ability to uh, set the uniformity of uh, index. So this is a separate metric that can be set with different tolerances to accommodate uh, how, uh, how uniform you want that area to be. Okay. Next cool. is what we call the question on uh, uniformity. No, no, this is absolute. This is perfectly fine. You get a, a specific value for a specific surface, absolute, and then you can do the comparison later on with whatever you want. This is perfectly understood. No, very nice. So there's no question right now. Okay, great. Just making sure. Yeah, we will um, let you next... go. Go for it. Okay. <laughs> well, I want you. Next... <laughs> next is the color vibrance index. And the color vibrance index quantifies multicolor points in the material. So the more multicolor points there are in the material, the higher the number. The less multicolor points in the material, the lower the number. 
So you can see on the left, we are taking a, a measurement of the satin wall paint. And if we were to uh, think of it almost as a uh, spot color gray paint uh, or a spot color gray ink. And then if you look four over, it's the CMYK equivalent of that where it's picking up on the rosettes of the screening and it's gonna have a higher number because it's not just one color in the, in the aperture, it's, it sees the sign magenta yellow black in the aperture and it's, it's counting that as a, a higher uh, metric, higher number. So we've, we found uses for all of these metrics in, in production and we'll go into some of the samples in a few minutes. To show you how the app works, with, with Chroma Checker, a, a lot of um, color programs give the data to the expert. Uh, with Chroma Checker, we give the data to everybody. So the president can look at the data and get a, a weekly report on how all their manufacturing devices are performing. And all the managers can get the data relevant to their equipment that they're responsible for. And even the operators can get a report and can log in to see how the device that they're responsible for has been performing. So you log in, whether it's the web browser version of Chroma Checker or the iPad version or the iPhone version, you type in your organizational name and then the operator credential. So if I log in as David Hunter with my, my personal password, it only shows me what I'm uh, capable of or what I've been granted the rights to see and work with. And this is also how we define what level of an operator they are, meaning are they an expert so they can make new objects or are they a basic operator that can only assess current objects. So when you log in, you then have, and, and by the way, I'll be giving a, 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 a I'll have my iPhone connected to the Nano and do some, some work with a close-up camera later, but you have the hierarchy of uh, what you're, you're measuring. So you have the product is the superset, the object is a subset of the project product, and then the track is a subset of the object. So you go in, measure at the track level, and then when you measure, you'll see quite a bit of detail here, but down below is the important where the image on the left is the reference, the image on the right is the live camera view that as the uh, instrument is moved around, you actually see the what it's viewing on the right. And then when you hit the button, either on the instrument or on the app, it captures that color and then it will assess whatever metrics you defined as normative to uh, determine whether or not it's a pass or fail. And in this area with this Oracle uh, material, you can see the average is a very gray color, which is shown on the left. Uh, and you see the, there's two, one's the reference, one's the measured. And then the color on the right, the white color is the dominant color. And when you look at this uh, object in the, in the camera view, you can see it's more white than it is gray. And it, it helps you see how the dominant algorithm works differently than the average algorithm. And, all instruments that I know of today work off an average of what's in the aperture area. But oftentimes, especially when we're dealing with textiles and, and different types of materials, everyone's done this. You've, you've taken a spectral, even a spherical spectral, and you measure fabric. And depending upon the tightness of the weave of the fabric, you'll get the shadow information that's returned to the sensor. And so oftentimes the color that you capture is darker than what your eye sees it as being. The purpose of this dominant algorithm is to overcome that and say, hey, the eye sees this as this color, even though the, the technical measured values are a different color, sometimes, uh, oftentimes what we really want is the dominant color. So that's a bit how that works. And then if you're an expert, these are all the settings that you have the ability to adjust from the iPhone to set your tolerances. So you can set um, whether or not you want the average to be um, average delta E to be uh, uh, normative and, and the dominant normative, or maybe you just want the dominant normative and the average delta E um, uh, informative. This determines what 
whether or not it, it's a solid pass or fail. Uh, and then, of course, you can set the uniformity, the vibrance, and the uh, surface match. Dave, we can, we can yeah. switch on the camera and maybe if a question, I just raise my hand and then you can uh, have a look uh, every two minutes to the screen and then maybe uh, come to me if I have a question. So there's one question. Uh, to do the examination, uh, does the owner of uh, the Nano should always be connected to the cloud? Uh, can you repeat that? To do such examination, the owner who uses the CC Nano should always be connected to the cloud or not? Uh, technically, yeah. I mean, it, it's um, the, uh, the phone is connected to the Nano and it, there's an app on the phone, so they're working with the app. Um, and then um, when they're measuring the value, the value is actually going up to the cloud and um, returning the results back down to the phone. Um, if, if the question is, can you run this without the cloud, I, uh, I've, I've actually never run into this situation before, so I'm going to have to, um, I don't think you can today, uh, but um, that's the first time I've asked. I've been asked that, so um, it would be it would be pretty easy to put it into the app itself. But I don't know that we have. I, I think to get the uh, to get the return values, you have to have a, a connection to the cloud. It's totally um, transparent to the operator once you log in. But anyone has your contact, so you can catch up with uh, David afterwards and then uh, sort out this question. Yeah. Perfect. So when when we look at the tracking report, and I, I know you wanted to take a, a break sometime around the hour mark. So um, yes, if you wish, if you find a, a good point that makes sense semantically, just uh, decide the next five to ten minutes as you wish. Yeah, yeah, I think uh, a couple more slides, and then it would be a good breaking point. But um, here's the uh, color inspector reporting that shows the tracking of the parameters that are being captured with the software. So you see surface match, uh, uniformity and vibrance, uh, average delta E, average delta H, uh, average delta L, delta C, whatever you're asking for. And But what's really important here is you can switch from a timeline view to a statistical distribution view. And this is critical because what I find is nobody knows what these metrics mean. They don't know what surface match means. They don't know what vibrancy means. So they don't know what the tolerance should be set for. So what we've done is we'll have the, the manufacturer do an actual run of the material or the product that they're wanting to assess. And they'll measure samples through that process. And then we'll look at them and we'll, of course, pull the samples out that we're measuring so we can look at them side by side. And we'd say, hey, in a typical uh, manufacturing run, what percentage of this would you fail? And they'll say, oh, 3%. Okay. So then we do our statistical distribution on what we've just done. We see what the surface match number is at 3%. Let's say it's uh, 89%. And, and now that tells us, well, if this is a typical manufacturing run with 3% waste, we set it for 89%. And now we can have a quantified uh, metric, uh, kind of a key performance indicator, if you will, in terms of what's necessary for this job to be accepted. And now we migrate off of the visual uh, interpretation of the result to a numeric interpretation of the result, which we, we like to call our platform a transition from graphic arts to print manufacturing. Get away from the visual, get into the numbers, all by the numbers. And, and this allows us to do it with appearance. And, and when I get in, into my examples, you'll see many more uh, situations of this type of scenario. Did you see my uh, my uh, raised hand? Does it work? <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay, okay, yeah. okay. Which tab should I look at? 
Okay. No, okay, okay. We can. No, I don't want to distract you. There, there's one question. Um, or what can we do if the evaluation gives us the information that um, um, we don't match what we expect? Is there? Uh, do we have some SOP to follow in order to improve the result, or is it uh, a tool to communicate to the supplier that uh, something went wrong? So, is it diagnose, diagnose, and therapy? I think is the question. You know, well, that's a really so, great question because that, that that's that's that that next step, right? Um, if it's wrong, what do we do about it? Yes, that's the question. Yes. And and what we've done on the print side is is we've added some very um, shall we call it intelligent algorithms in our software. So let's say you're dealing with a large format device and you measure the print and it fails. Depending upon how it fails, our software will display a message telling the operator what they should do to try to fix it, including something as sophisticated as if they measure a large format output and three of the four solids are at the right density and the tonality of three of the four solids are the right tonality, but one is light through the whole scale, including the solid, our software is smart enough to say, hey, check your magenta head. Your magenta ink head looks like it's clogged. Please clean it. So based on the, the data that we're getting and our knowledge of print, we can, we can make these intelligent messages for the operator so they know what to do. Um, that architecture is built into this solution as well. We haven't implemented it yet because we don't have enough experience with uh, how people are going to be using this, but we've partnered with companies like Canon and HP uh, so that they've told us when, when you see this on this device, it usually means this is what's happening and this is the primary cause, this could be the secondary cause. So we got that built into our software for some printing devices. There's no reason why we couldn't do this for uh, different manufacturing processes. Cool. Okay. Very cool. And, yeah. then, and then when you go into um, when you go into let's see here. Okay. When we go into the next slide, um, this is the report data. So for every measurement ever done, it collects all of this information. And it, if you can see over on the left, it's got delta E, delta L, delta H, and the values for both dominant and average colors. And like I mentioned earlier, there's only one checkbox one uh, green check here because that's the only data that we said was normative for the for the color part but you could literally have all these checked if you wanted and you could set the minimum max tolerance or for delta e it's one but you'd set all these numbers here to to assess whether or not it's right or wrong and then we also attempt to show you where you are in the color space with the cie uh, uh, cross-section and of course the reference and the uh, average. Okay. Um, th here's a, a real example of measuring the aperture uh, and that the logo, the chroma checker logo, that orange dot is a very small dot, but with this instrument, you can um, pinch it down. And, and remember, this is the picture that's stored in the cloud. So, if, if someone measured uh, something and it failed, you see the picture and they didn't measure the right place on the object, you know it right away because it's in the picture. It's all documented, which is, which is quite useful. So the uh, next part of this presentation gets into some uh, uh, actual examples. I think now's a good time to perfect, take, perfect. take a quick break and then we'll come back. We'll talk about some other examples and uh, show the uh solution what, live what one final question dave 
the, the, the metric number, did you do it for us only or because I expect normally inch in your world or do you also use uh, millimeters in the US now? I'm very surprised. I, I'm sorry, what's the question? <laughs> I see the metric numbers, you know, millimeters. And normally oh. I expect inches uh, and square inches and, and <laughs> it's... Um, so I, I can answer it two ways. You know, from a scientific standpoint, everything's millimeters, everything's metric. So from that standpoint, uh, we, we've... We've Maybe other, used, other questions. Do you have another yeah. presentation with inches? Um, no. Okay, I don't perfect. have another. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. No. Ten, ten minutes bio break. Yeah. Okay. I have a coffee here. Uh, it's a cafe, you know. So uh, unfortunately, uh, we cannot uh, host you here. I have not having you here. So that's why we need to have a remote uh, cafe. So we reconvene in ten minutes. Yeah. Yes, sounds great. All right, so this second part, we'll just finish with talking about some examples that we've uh, been successful with in terms of implementing the solution. And then I'll give a uh, quick demonstration of how it works with, uh, uh, let's see, we'll use this uh, RAL target here that I'm sure some of you have seen. It's the same color with uh, four different textures and just kind of take questions as we go through measuring it and showing the actual results. So keep the questions coming. Um, one of the uh, uh, scenarios that we've um, run into recently is a case study related to structural varnishes. And the question is that um, when is the texture or the appearance of the varnish too bad to accept. And you can see uh, in this case, the there's a gap in the varnish, which is due to a probably a dirty roller or something. And today it's all subjective in terms of measuring it or looking at it and saying, yeah, it's too big or too bad, too bad, what have you. Whereas by using the nano and putting it on that object and using the surface match characteristics, we can assess that in this case, it fails, meaning it's it's too large. So using a, a quantitative process to eliminate the subjectivity to ensure the high-end packaging examples with these types of special finishes are, are appropriate. Um, I've um, done a bunch of work with uh, uh, Mark Jeeves with Color Logic, who do the uh, it's the color logic that does the work related to the uh, special finishes and the, the embossing and, and those types of things in, in the print process. And we found that the nano is capable of measuring some things from a process control standpoint that they weren't able to do before. So as more and more special finishes and, and um, uh, special effects work their way into the print area, uh, this becomes a, a viable solution to check to make sure those processes were applied properly. Next example is uh, a zoom of the actual uh, video that we showed you, showing the different textures of the, the paper. And um, this is a unique example of a uh, using the dominant color algorithm. We were working with a printer that um, they didn't have a, a color bar on their sheet for magenta, but they did have a star target for magenta. So by using the, the dominant color algorithm, we were able to figure out exactly what was the density of the magenta ink on this uh, print because of the, the dominant color. We didn't need a, a, a three millimeter by three millimeter patch to measure, uh, which was unique. This next example uh, has to do with the cosmetics industry. We've got some really good makeup samples, but this is one on a nail polish. And when we're talking about a mirrored uh, reflection, that's, the, that's a case that can give this uh, solution an issue. And you're seeing it on the nail polish in that uh, the, white, the white lines that you see here those are actually um, those are actually the the uh, 
reflection from the illuminant in the instrument itself. And you can see from this that the, the lights are uh, 360 degrees around the, uh, the outside. And so we just had to choose our, our aperture to uh, uh, not get the reflection of the lights. And we were able to get a, um, a, a valid reading for what that color uh, should look like. Here's a, 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 the concept of an automobile. Um, we've got a couple projects going here because it's, it's such a busy and complex environment with so many different um, materials and, and shades of material. And to quantify all of these different materials in a way that provides a appearance match can be quite challenging, but the nano can uh, accommodate this type of um, situation very, very easily. And just to give you an idea, you have different textiles, hard plastic, soft plastic, synthetic leather, leather, real leather potentially, and using the groups and the products and the object um, hierarchy within the chroma checker system gives you the ability to organize these uh, objects in, in the right categories and yet still compare them to one another to make sure that the overall effect is uh, in, in line with the expectations of our eyes. So here's a unique situation that we had where um, the, uh, the customer tried to fool the system and uh, it was the right color in all cases, but different patterns. And the, the far right one, they even tried to simulate the pattern with a, a, a hexagon type pattern. Uh, and yet you see the differences and the instrument saw the differences and it failed the result. Uh, here's a sample of the, uh, the uh, the RAL target that I held up earlier. So you can see the uniformity. This is where the uniformity comes in. The, the first patch on the RAL target, uniformity is 0.9. But the what I call the, the popcorn ceiling one, the one with the high degree of texture, this sample has a uniformity of 3.4. So uh, in this way, we can um, set the uniformity as a metric here or we could also do a surface match. And, and this is also a great sample because it shows you the difference between the dominant color algorithm and the average color algorithm. When you take a look at uh, this sample, obviously it was painted with the exact same color paint. But when you have this level of texture on the object, there's shadows in, in here. And, the instrument can be fooled by the shadows. Uh, and I've measured this with a, a 45 zero instrument with a small aperture and gotten the, the, the delta E differences between these patterns is like nine. But when you do a, let's say a, a eight millimeter aperture device like a Barbieri, and we measure the difference between this color and this color, it's down around three delta E, three or four. Well, it's still, in fact, the exact same color, but even, and, and by the way, with a spherical instrument, it's gonna be about a three to four delta E difference as well. So uh, an eight millimeter 45 zero instrument will give a very similar result as a spherical instrument with a, with a 12 millimeter aperture to tell you what the difference is between these. And I, I was always under the impression that a spherical would tell me, hey, the color's the same. It's not. Um, I, I, I always had in my head that spiracles were like the, this grand old solution. And when I started using them, I found that it, it has a lot of the same issues that a 45-0 instrument has. And um, when I say issues, it, it, there's only so much it can do. But with, with the nano, the, the dominant color difference between these two, instead of being a, a three or four, comes out to a Point six. So if that's what you're really caring about, is the same color is applied to different textures, this will tell you that, which is quite powerful. 
the, 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 the beauty about your language is that you have are in English a paint and color to differentiate the, the, the stuff you apply to something and the appearance you have later on. In German, the problem is that we call all everything Faber, so both the perception is Faber and the paint uh, and the Farbmittel is Faber. And so uh, it's, it's easy on your language to say to have the same paint on the sample and that getting a slightly different color because the color uh, by means of its um, yeah, um, color scientist definition, it's just a difference of an object or uh, opinion or uh, perception between two objects seeing side by side. And if you see them side by side, the, 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 the mountain uh, sample uh, due to the shadows looks a little bit, depending on the way of illumination, uh, darker. So that's why, um, yeah, but it's, it's interesting. I would have expected the, that large aperture um, spherical measurements with specular included, of course, uh, will give closer readings between the two samples. That is also something we have to 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 chase down later. Yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah. It, I'll tell you, I, I'm learning something new every day with this. It's 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 really exciting. It's um, it's a lot of fun. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, he, Here's a, a special effects that I kind of referred to earlier. So here's some different RAL special effects in or Oracle, and you can see the uh, how the the uniformity and the vibrance uh, come into play in terms of measuring these types of what we'll call very difficult or very challenging uh, samples, and uh, with uh, the ability to measure these different metrics. We can now quantify these special effects in ways that we couldn't do before. And so again, in summary, we're, we're talking about defining an appearance match. So what is the visual impression and, and, and applying objective numbers to this? So we want to always replace subjectivity. And this is where the dominant color comes in. And then the surface match helps uh, correlate it or, or reinforce it, if you will. And in this scenario, yeah, the, the colors within one delta E, um, even the average colors within one delta E, which for all print applications is, is virtually always acceptable. And if it's not, you don't want to work with that customer. <laughs> uh, the surface match, is at 23%, which means it's not even close. So in this way, we can really quantify what's, uh, what's important. And, and when we look at the different instruments we have in the market today, we have all types of instruments. And um, what we've tried to do with our software is support all of these types of instruments, including um, instruments that do what we call Gonional appearance. And this is where the, the nano comes in, is that it, it gives us the ability to do uh, uh, metrics related to special effects of the object's surface. And, and so even though the nano only fits in a couple of these categories, our software supports all these categories. So um, I want to make sure we reinforce that uh, uh, there isn't just one way to do things. And then that's what this slide talks about is uh, uh, no single objective way to measure the appearance. And our architecture uh, provides us the ability to define the same object with as many different measurement conditions and parameters that you need to to ensure that that object is meeting your expectations in terms of reproduction. Um, pricing, since this is so new and, and, and you've got what I would say is the uh, leading group of individuals that I know of who are researching this topic, we've put together a special program for uh, everyone attending today, uh, that you can test drive the Nano for 14 days. Uh, we'll set you up with the Chroma Checker Cloud account, 
and you can start experimenting with how the nano can work in your situation. And, and we're going to uh, make every attempt to support you in this process because um, this is important to us. And we know there's over 100 people uh, watching today's presentation, but um, we will do our best to be reactive to you guys and help you because this is a learning experience for everybody. And if this product doesn't perform to a, a capability that you need it to, we will refund your money when we get the instrument back from you. So it's, it's literally a no risk offer for you to uh, work with this technology and, and see how it, how it uh, performs. And um, I'm, I'm grateful for Andy for giving us this oh, opportunity. Thank you very much for that great offer. We did not uh, urge you to do that, or just to let people know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we did it on our own free will. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Uh, perfect, perfect. Yeah, yeah. Anyone, um, anyone is, is fe uh, feel free to approach you to um, to test that uh, the device. And uh, again, one more time for those. I see a few guys in the attendance list also being part of the color management symposium. We had the um, Mafuchi, um, Gerato. Uh, as a speaker, where we uh, have also seen some tests and applications for this kind of uh, device to, to double check. Um, great, great. Is this a, right. the, 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 okay. is this the final slide or is it more to come? Is it just? Uh, pretty much uh, final slide. Okay, okay, perfect, perfect, perfect. So, okay, so now let's, let's try, let's encourage anyone to, to uh, Raise his hands to also ask uh, a question. Let me just also have a look here because we have two computers here, and the problem is, is if you honest, deleting one question which we have uh, asked, um, my doesn't. So I see all the questions again, and then you do it. Um, Paul Trappelt has a question. Paul. Hi, good afternoon, Andy. Good afternoon, Dave. Hope you're all well. David, um, a few slides back, you had a metric in percentages which gave you an overall score. So that's looking obviously at the LAB numbers and the free appearance models you're, you're measuring. Are these weighted against each other in any way, or is that user defined? Um, let's get to the slide that you're thinking of. But what was it this slide or what slide was it? No, it's the one which had the percentage scores on. Oh, like this one? No, it was a, still a table. It was still a table. Keep going back. It was a few. It was. I. No. No, it's quite a long way back before this last half of the presentation. Yeah, a couple back from this. That's it. Oh, no, maybe? That, yeah, that there. You've got the percentage score for match, which is looking at all the metrics. Are those metrics weighted to get to that score, or is it just an even 25% of this, 25% of that, 25% of that, which would add up to 100% less, less the issues? And is that user definable? Okay, okay. I, so I, I, I know what you're saying, asking Paul. So, so essentially, uh, what, what, we're, what we're seeing in this graphic is the individual metrics that Chroma Checker is checking on the device. So that first red timeline is the surface match. So it's mm -hmm. not an aggregate of all the values. It's, it's just the surface match. And then the next graph is the uniformity and the vibrance index and the scores on that. We, we don't have today a superset score that says, um, boy, if surface match is 90 and the vibrance is uh, two and this is four, then you get a 95% score. Overall. We, overall. This is, we, we, yeah, this is for yeah, our we, research. <laughs> yeah, we, we have not, yeah, exactly. This is for Andy's research. 
obviously that would be something we could easily add. Um, we don't have that today. But oh, there is something that's what I was talking about. There's a match in the table. There's just the word match, and maybe this was a little bit misleading because this means I expect surface match. You know, in your table, in your yes. table, yeah, there's just the word the word match left, left to the percentage or no, right to the vibrance. That's just right. the table, the table entry, and that's why that's maybe. That's what I thought. Andy. I thought it was an overall really score feedback. of all the metrics. Yes. Yeah, 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 that's really good feedback. Makes sense. Yep. That's Thanks, something great. we can definitely do as as we mature in this uh, solution. That would be an obvious next uh, next thing to look at. And and anything we do, Paul, it would definitely uh, allow the customer to weight which metric gets what percentage of the overall score. Thank you. That's great. Enjoy no it. No problem. Oh, thank you. Now, what I'd like to do, it, obviously take any questions, but I'm going to flip over to my um, a supplemental camera, and we're going to actually do some work with this instrument while I'm talking with you. So if people have questions about the actual uh, app itself, uh, we can go through that. Now... Give me a second to flip cameras. Okay. Are you seeing? We see the E factor. The oh. chroma check the E factor presentation. So you're not seeing a camera. Let's. No, we're not seeing a camera. Okay, we see a camera with with your face and your table in the background. With me looking down. Right. Now it's frozen. Let's try, let's try it again. Now it's a still picture. Maybe the last one again. Just go. Yeah, perfect. Now we see something. You see white. White and a line, and now your mountain, your green mountain. Okay, the great. Alps. Now we see the Alps. All right, awesome. The Rocky, so the now, Rocky Mountains. The Rocky Mountains. <laughs> the Rocky Mountains, yes. Or how about the Alps? Let's say the Alps. So here I have my iPhone app. And um, I have my iPhone app, and I'm going to uh, uh, tell the system. Uh, first off, a couple things about the instrument, which is unique. Uh, and I, I apologize for the lighting here. It's not the greatest. But there's, uh, you see the hole in the bottom of the instrument, and when it's closed like that, and I just rotated it, uh, the, the calibration plate is on the back of this sleeve. So when you uh, calibrate it, the instrument is closed. When you, um, after you've calibrated and you're ready to measure, you open it up. And then once it's opened up, I can go ahead and say I'm going to compare to my first uh, color, and it says connect to the instrument. So I'm going to click on the button on the instrument and it will connect to it. And now it's asking me to calibrate it. So I'm closing the, uh, the cover and it's calibrating the instrument. And now it's ready. So the white that you see in the uh, window here on the right is the calibration plaque. As I open that up, you see the, the lights coming through the instrument. And as I put it on the object here, uh, you can see the live view of the Alps mountain range there. And uh, if I go to the first patch, which is here, and I say, go ahead and measure it, just by clicking on the button, you can see it passes. And when I move it to the next patch, I click the button once to activate the window. So you see it's live. Can, can you guys see the phone well Thank enough? You. So you see if I put it on the, cali uh, the uh, white backer here, it's, it's white, and I put it on here, and it, you see a texture, and then I click on the button, it measures it, and it fails. And we'll move our way down to <clears throat> the uh, Alps. There's the live view, so I can uh, stay away from the deep valleys and pick one that's uh, not so deep and say measure and it still fails. And you can see the um, 
zero uh, percent uh, surface match. So it goes zero to 100. It's saying this isn't even close, <laughs> which is right. And uh, so now I'm going to come up here to this next one and measure. And again, it fails. So it's, it's very simple to use, uh, very easy. Now, each of these measurements has been automatically uploaded and stored in the cloud. And if I wanted to go measure something else at this point, I can just go back and I can um, choose a different product. So here's one of my skin color. And this is, uh, uh, I don't have my, I, I can go in here and choose to see how my skin color works here. So I'm gonna put it now on my arm. You can see the live screen and measure it and it comes up and it fails. And you can see that the color is different and the um, both the average and the dominant color. Because when I did this was last summer, when I don't get tan, I, I just kind of get red. <laughs> and I was a little more red than I am now being uh, in January. But um, hopefully you can see the, the flexibility and, and the capability of how this works. Are there questions while I'm in this mode? Uh, let's see. No, I think anyone is following you. Uh, that's interesting. To me, actually, uh, I see there is a small industry with very high quality, high price instruments, you know, 20,000, 30,000 euros. Uh, you know, the reflectance analyzer and the, the spectro 2 profiler and the uh, re other uh, instruments used in the automotive or in the industry. So I think this really, really uh, try to bridging uh, that gap. Um, it really sounds very promising to me. Yeah. Great. I'm I'm really happy you feel that way. Um, yes. So that that really is the uh, content that I w had prepared for everybody. Um, Everyone's got my contact information. If you need to or want to connect with me, please do. We're, uh, we're very um, happy to accommodate anyone's needs in terms of seeing if this uh, will fit a... Can you share, can you share your, your, your slides again with the, with the email briefly? And then, oh, absolutely. Um, yeah, but we will again share the PDFs, uh, of course, later. Uh, so this is something... Um, uh, of course, we provide uh, later on. Uh, again, the recordings, both of the video and the material, is uh, only for Cochra members. That's kind of the deal here to have the online event free of charge for anyone, uh, but the recording stuff is only for Cochra members. It's kind to also provide some benefits for the Cochra members and maybe some motivations for others to to become a member. Of course, um, that's for sure. So thank you very much, Dave. Let's have a look at. Uh, there's one very important question because uh, for me, uh, there's a Richard Hunter, a very, um, you know, the uh, maybe you know, already know my question with a very famous book about measuring the appearance. Very, very good book, actually. And, and is there any connection between you and him or? Ah, uh, too bad. No, my, my dad was a scientist, uh, but animal science. Okay, okay. He did use spectrophotometers in his work, which I didn't find out till I was, uh, I don't know, 30 years old. I found out he used, he used the word spectrophotometer at the dinner table one day, and I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> cool, cool. Very, very, very cool. Yeah, this is something, unfortunately, you can't buy the book anymore. We need to go to eBay and get some used ones. Uh, again, the measurement of appearance. So anyone who would like to, to, to read into the basics of this, uh, I can highly recommend that book from Richard S. Hunter. Uh, perfect, perfect. Let's have a final look on our people here. Last chance. Going, going, gun. Okay, Dave, thank you very much again uh, for being with us. And we stay thank in you, contact. Andy. Thanks for having me. It's always great. Um, you know, looking forward to coming back to Munich. Perfect, perfect. Yeah, we have, uh, ah, I forget the slide, you know, we have the, the 
uh, the date already for the color management symposium uh, next year. You know, we were one week or two weeks before the lockdown. So this was, I was so uh, relieved when we managed uh, the 2020 symposium. And so we are quite positive. Already we have a date, we negotiated with the hotel, so we are positive to have it in March 2022. So um, some time to digest and maybe we can have you as a speaker again. Let's check. I will, I will follow up definitely with a few of our Texas sample things. Uh, again, thank you anyone for being with us. Um, greetings to the US and see you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.